evening, my little angel. As mentioned in the previous episode, black cats and bats are the famous and familiar Halloween characters. As with witches, black cats have been recorded in the history of Halloween since the Middle Ages in Europe. And if people once thought that witches were representatives of heresy, then black cats were one of the symbol of the devil. This is because among the people who were once accused and tried for witchcraft in medieval Europe, many old cats, especially black cats. From then on, people began to believe that cats were friends, familiar witches of witches, supporting them in practicing dark magic. Even black cats are places where a spirit can enter to convey something. As for the bat, bats believed to have been present at the earliest pre-Halloween celebration were symbolic and literal. The Celtic people lit large bonfires to attract insects during the Samhain festival, attracting bats too. Gradually, the presence of bats became associated with the festival. It gradually expanded with the development of the European folk culture in the Middle Ages, creating superstitious theories that bats were having girls of dead. Today, such ways of thinking about black cats and bats have been proven incorrect and are only entertaining images associated with Halloween. The last things for this year's Halloween are colors and candle lighting habits. The traditional colors of Halloween are black and orange. This also has its origin in the festival of Samhain. For the Celts, black symbolized the death of summer, while orange represented the autumn harvest. For much of Halloween's early history, soaring bonfires were lit to light the way for souls to find their way to the afterlife. Nowadays, those big fires are replaced by burning candles on Halloween night. There are still others about Halloween, but this year's Halloween was over. We will save them for the next year. And now, I return to Toto Chan. Today's two chapters are both beautiful names. Her second year at Tomoe and Swan Lake. Tender green leaves were sprouting on all the trees in the school grounds, and the flowers in the flower beds were busy blossoming. Crocuses, daffodils, and pansies popped out their heads to say, How do you do? to the pupils of Tomoe, and the tulips lengthened their stalks as if stretching themselves. Jerry buds trembled in the soft breeze, all set and ready, waiting for the signal to burst into bloom. The black Popeyes, followed by the other goldfish living in a small square concrete food freezing basin by the swimming pool, shook themselves and started to swim about happily. There was no need to say it's spring for the season when everything looks shining and fresh and lively needed no announcement. Everyone knew it was spring. It was exactly a year since the morning Toto Chan first arrived at Tomoe Gakuen with mother. She was so surprised to find the bait growing out of the ground and so excited to see the classrooms in the train that she jumped up and down. And she was so sure that Mr. Kobayashi Shosaku, the headmaster, was her friend. Now, Toto chan and her classmates rejoiced in the new status as second graders, while in came the new first grade children, looking on around curiously just as Toto chan and her classmates had done. It had been an eventful year for Toto chan and she had eagerly looked forward for every single morning of it. She still liked street musicians, but she had learned to appreciate many, many more things around her. The little girl who had been expelled for being a nuisance had grown into a child worthy of Tomoe. Some parents had misgivings about Tomoe's education, there were times when even Toto chans mother and daddy wondered if they had done the right thing. Among parents who regarded Mr. Kobayashi's educational system dubiously and judged it 
superficially, just by what they saw, were some who became so alarmed about leaving their children at his school that they arranged to change for them elsewhere. But the children themselves didn't want to leave Tomoe and cried. Fortunately, no one was living in Totochan's class, but a boy one grade above had tears streaming down his cheeks as he vented his despair by pounding on a headmaster's back with clenched fists, the scarf on a great knee flapping all the while. The headmaster's eyes grew red from crying too. The lad was finally led away from the school by his mother and father. As he went, he kept on turning around and waving time after time. But there were not many sad occasions like that, and Toto Chan was now a second grader, with the expectation of more daily surprises and delight. By this time, Toto Chan's comeback was well acquainted with her back. Toto Chan was taken to Hibiya home to see the bullet squall lake. Daddy was playing the violin solo, and a very fine troupe was performing. It was the first time she was ever been to a ballet. A squint of the squad wore a tiny sparkling crown on her head and leapt through the air effortlessly, like a real swan, or so it seemed to Toto Chan. The prince fell in love with the swan queen and put on orders. Finally, the two of them danced together so tenderly. The music, too, made a great impression to Tutu Chan, and after she got home, she couldn't stop thinking about it. The next day, when she woke up, she went straight down to the kitchen where the mother was, without even brush her hair, and announced, I don't want to be a spy anymore, or street musician, or a ticket seller. I'm going to be a ballerina and dance in a squat lake. Oh, said mother. She didn't seem surprised. It was the first time Tutu Chan had ever seen a bole, but she had heard a great deal from the headmaster about Isadora Duncan, an American lady who danced beautifully. Like Mr. Kobayashi, Miss Isadora Duncan has been influenced by Sir Dan Cross. If the headmaster she admired so much liked Isadora Duncan, that was enough for Toto Chan, and although she had never seen her dance, she felt as if she knew her. So, to be a dancer didn't seem anything out of ordinary to Toto Chan. It so happened that a friend of Mr. Kobayashi's who came to taught Euromix at Tomoe had a dance studio nearby. Mother arranged for Toto Chan to take lessons in his studio after school. Mother never told Toto Chan that she must do this or that, but when Toto Chan wanted to do something, she could agree, and without asking all sorts of questions, she could go ahead and make the arrangements. Toto Chan began taking lessons at studio, longing for the day she could able to dance one leg. But the teacher had his own particular method. Besides the Euro mix as he did at Tomoe, he could have the pupils embed about the piano or phonograph music, repeating to themselves some such phrases as Shine upon the mountain from the prayer, cleanse my soul, oh shine upon the mountain, chanted by the pilgrims as they climbed Mount Fuji. Suddenly, the teacher could exclaim, Post! And the pupils could have to assume some pose they devise themselves and stand still. The teacher could pose too, with some emotive cry like arch, and assume a looking up to heaven pose, or sometimes that of a person in agony, crouching down and holding his head with both hands. The image Toto Chan cherished in her mind, however, was that a squad wearing a sparkling crown and a frilly white costume. It was not shine upon the mountain or arch. One day, Toto Chan plucked up her courage and went over to the teacher. Although he was a man, he had curly hair and bangs. Toto Chan stretched her arms out and flashed them like the wings of a squan. Aren't we ever going to do anything like this? She asked. The teacher was a handsome man with large brown eyes and an aquiline nose. 
We don't do that kind of dancing here, he said. After that, Toto Chan stopped going to his studio. Ashley, she liked leaping about in bare feet, not wearing ballet shoes and striking poses, she thought of herself. But after all, she did so want to wear one of those tiny, glittering crowns. Squalet is nice, said the teacher. But I wish I could get you to like just dance according to your fancy. It wasn't until years later that Toto Chan found out that his name was Ishii Baku and that he not only introduced free ballet to Japan but also gave the name Jiyu Gaoka, the Freedom Hill, to the area. In addition to all that, he was 50 at the time. This man tried to teach Toto Chan the joy of dancing freely. The two chapters could fill with light, wind, and branches full of Arctic's emotions, but also contain memories that can make different thoughts arise in listeners' minds of different ages. What do you think about after this listening time? It's late at night in the cold season. Wrap yourself in a warm blanket and have changed dreams, my little love. Today's story time is over. I wish my angel a good night's sleep. I kiss you long on your forehead. See you again next time.